Welcome to the first. You have a story. If you look back on your life, you've done things for the first time that no one in your family, in your town, in the country has done. This is Dr. Sandy. You have unknowingly paved the way for others without knowing it or even acknowledging it. This is where you tell your story so that those who come after you can walk in your footsteps to build their own firsts. Hey everybody, today I'm speaking to Jason Julius. Jason has spent the last 17 years pursuing his vision of building his business, which are coffee junkies and pizza junkies. He's building them into national brands. This is a dual brand food and beverage concept under one roof. He's currently located in Indiana and that has now turned this brand into a national franchise opportunity. He was inspired by Starbucks' success for more than a decade, but he never took action. However, he started his entrepreneurial journey six months after his son passed away from cancer. He is looking for people in the Midwest to expand in the area and then franchise and scale. Everybody, Jason has a billion dollar master plan and he's looking to bring small businesses with him. His podcast is The Jason Julius Files, and he's always looking for great entrepreneurs to be guests. So if you're an entrepreneur, reach out to him. Let's welcome Jason. Hey, everybody. Today, I'm speaking with Jason Julius. And Jason is an owner of Coffee Junkies and Pizza Junkies. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your your business, your coffee junkies and your uh, pizza junkies. Uh, okay. So, I mean, honestly, I think I'd have to be pretty obvious that, uh, that I mean, coffee junkies was inspired from watching uh, the, the Starbucks empire grow. Uh, and it was something that, I had a friend of mine that was when I was working at Chrysler that he walked into the plant and he was carrying a little 12 ounce cup and he told me that it was espresso and that he was paying $4 for it. Uh, and, and that intrigued me because I realized that this wasn't your mom and pop 50 cent coffee, uh, that if you could actually sell a cup of liquid for $4, that there, that there could actually be profit in it. Uh, and it inspired me to, uh, to start looking at it and, and my brain chewed on it for well over a decade before I actually did anything with it. Um, the business itself was inspired due to the loss of my son to cancer. Uh, I needed something for my brain to wrap around because I feared the worst. Um, when I had family that, that I responsibilities that I still needed to, to provide for and take care of and, and protecting my own mental health through the process. So six months after he died, I started Coffee Junkies, and I jumped into entrepreneurship with uh, with both feet. Wow. About eight years, yeah, about eight years after I started Coffee Junkies, I wanted to take all the lessons that I had learned and apply it to a new brand. And I had my first pizza delivery job uh, the day that I got my driver's license. So I applied all of the principles that I had employed creating Coffee Junkies and created Pizza Junkies in a test kitchen. And a year later, I wondered what they would look like under one roof. So I did it. Uh, I moved pizza junkies out of the test kitchen into the main operation and started trying to figure out how they would coexist and how they would work together. And, and the beauty of it is that most food and beverage businesses will open up and they have a, uh, they have a core food item and then they surround it with peripheral drinks where I had come at it from, I created a whole special G drink menu. And then when I created pizza junkies, then I created a specialty food line and, and they complement each other very well. That's very interesting. I mean, sometimes I'll see Dunkin' Donuts partner with someone else, you know, in the food business. And I always wondered how that worked, that model worked together. So when I saw yours, I have a couple of questions around that. And I noticed your your vice uh, theme. I call it your vice theme. 
because there's an alcohol kind of theme using bruise and shots and black eye. Oh, black. I never equated coffee with a black eye, but uh, you did. And then you have uh, coffee porn. <laughs> and then you have junkies, and I'm like, oh, he went the whole vice route, the whole addiction, you know, route there. So, what inspired that thought of getting the name like junkies, coffee and pizza junkies? Uh, I mean, honestly, when it comes to the junkies brand itself, it's, uh, I mean, I have a pretty deep sarcastic side, and, and I knew that I was taking a risk. Um, but it was meant to be a tongue in cheek because, I mean, if you are a coffee lover, like you truly are a coffee junkie. Uh, and I mean, by majority in this nation, people eat pizza two to three times a week. So it's very much a, a staple, uh, of their, of their diet in general. Um, but when it comes to the overall, as far as the branding, when I very first opened up, I realized that that Starbucks had created their own language. Uh, that, that I mean, like they literally own the word Frappuccino. Uh, and I would have people come through, and they would they would give me a name of a drink that I'm like, well, Starbucks owns that, but we can try and do something similar. But it just didn't take long before I was like, two can play at this game. Uh, so not only was I developing the Coffee Junkies brand. I made sure that as we developed our drink menu, that they were all mini brands themselves, that you could only order the drink from us the same way Starbucks. So, I mean, many of their, most all of their drinks, you're, you're not going to go to another coffee shop and order that drink because it's a proprietary branded name. And, and to date, uh, 80% of both our coffee junkies menu and our pizza junkies menu is our specialty branded products and, and by and large just the majority of what people order on our menus and what states are you in what states are can we find coffee junkies and pizza junkies? Uh, currently it's just indiana uh but i started coffee junkies in 2005 and from day one my vision was uh, as a national brand uh, we are now licensed and registered as a franchiser, and it's only been here within the last month that I've actually started uh, putting that franchise opportunity out there. So I fully intend Coffee Junkies and Pizza Junkies to grow very large in Indiana and then move regionally and eventually into a full-blown national brand. So if someone from New York, let's say, is interested in Coffee Junkies, are you waiting until you launch in Indiana first before coming to New York? Or is there a wait list? Uh, no, it's, I have a like a different frame of mind when it comes to that stuff. Uh, because you have single store operations, then you have multi-unit operations, uh, then you can have territory purchases or master franchisers. I know middle America very well, so I want to offer those single store and potentially some small multi-unit opportunities in middle America. But when we start getting into major metropolis and getting out to the East Coast and the West Coast, those are the areas that I'm interested in uh, in territory purchases. Somebody that wants to come along and agree to a large build out of a state that that they have personal knowledge of and, and uh, monetary backing that they're capable of, of executing uh, in their respective areas. Because when you get into coastal areas, I do not personally have a large frame of reference. So I'm looking for people that, that that's their home base and that's an area that, that they want to invest in and they know the rules and regulations uh, to be able to build out their own areas. Great. And do, are you online? Can someone order coffee coffee online? Or, well, I was going to say pizza, but you're not going to send pizza to New York, clearly. No, and that's, uh, I mean, yes, uh, coffeejunkies.com and pizzajunkies.com uh, are, are both live and have been for some time. Uh, so we have the online ordering and we have the mobile app. Uh, and then when you get on there, you'll find that uh, that we've got links to our franchising and here soon, 
links to the full apparel line for all of the products uh, for the for the clothing type products that we offer. It's a uh, I'm it's, even after 17 years, I'm still feel like I'm building out foundational pieces, uh, but I feel like we're at the point where I've built a pretty solid foundation, and now we're actually looking to scale. Yeah, you know, I I felt like that with my other business. We we grew it and grew it, and then I'm like, it still can grow more. Like growth is never ending, you know, if you want. So I totally get where where you are, you are right now. So for uh, can someone buy coffee junkies without buying pizza junkies, or is it a package deal? Uh, currently, it's a package deal. Uh, I have to when I look at being a young franchiser, I've looked out there and tried to learn from mistakes in the industries, and it's very important that the operations open up uh, with a very high success rate. So I know that the highest success rate is going to come uh, by the, the dual brand under one roof concept itself. So five, 10 years from now, I feel like there are specific circumstances where it might be worth it or, or more ideal in an area that each brand can stand on their own. Uh, but up front, when I'm thinking about the, the brand development and making sure that a uh, I mean, ultimately, I'm looking for 100% success, uh, but to give us or myself and the franchisee uh, the best opportunity for success, the dual brand under one roof concept is what I, it's what I believe the, uh, the special sauce is. Got it. So let's, uh, let's talk about uh, what you're first at doing. What are you first in creating this kind of space? Uh, where you have a dual brand. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, that is, I, I mean, I really felt like inside of the coffee industry or the pizza industry that, uh, that there was only really innovation to be had, that there really wasn't anything original. Uh, but when I started looking at what I had done, it wasn't that I was trying to be original. I'm just a consummate tester and I was willing to test. And once I successfully got them under one roof and got them working well together, I realized that uh, that nobody else had been crazy enough to try and put a coffee shop and a pizza place under one roof. And and if I had done something original, it was it was in doing that. It was uh, getting two very successful industries merged under one roof and uh, and successfully working with each other as a dual brand under one roof concept. So what are some of the obstacles that you ran into, into trying to get this dual brand together? I, I, well, I mean, as far as the customer facing side of it, it was the obvious people looking at it and saying, wait a minute, is this a coffee shop or is this a pizza place? Uh, and I, to my, it was like, well, it's both. Um, but it was through trial and error and looking at businesses, you one of the things when it comes to the food and beverage industry is that you have like hot and cold times of the day. So when I was looking to put them together, it was because I was looking to level out revenue on a, on an hourly basis. And so it was getting them figuring out who was going to do what and who was going to be responsible for what and at what time of day. So the coffee business is obviously it's gangbusters in the morning. And the pizza business is gangbusters in the evening. And then I was looking at how I could blend them at lunchtime so that ultimately the business is gangbusters in the afternoon from open to close. Right. And, and ultimately what it came down to was, I mean, when you look at a restaurant, Coffee Junkies is the front of the house and they handle all of the drinks and they handle all of the customer interaction. And Pizza Junkies is the back of the house, and they handle all of the food service and all of the delivery, uh, and they handle a lot of the heavy lifting as far as ordering, inventory, uh, managing uh, the back side of the kitchen area. So is it an eat-in or a takeout establishment? Uh, and I will say both. Uh, so I have two operations. Uh, one of them is our home store, and the second operation I opened in Indianapolis uh, as the proof of concept. 
Well, the home store operation is 3,000 square foot and it offers dine-in. Uh, the Indianapolis operation is only 1,700 square foot. So the dining room was the first piece that had to go. Uh, so we do uh, pick up, uh, drive through, catering, delivery, but in the main store in Kokomo, we also offer the dining room. Okay. So what are some of the good things now that you're in this build out phase and you're rolling out? What are some of the good things that you're learning about being the first in the, in this area? Um, well, it's, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, uh, I have always been, I guess, that, that consummate rebel. Um, so I enjoy on some level, even as a small business, feeling like I'm being a disruptor. Um, but a lot of that comes from my, my personal background, uh, and the culture that, that I want where the people are more important than anything else, the relationships and the connectivity. Where so, did you learn that? Where, what background taught you that, Dale? Uh, so I worked at Chrysler uh, in Kokomo, Indiana for about 15 years. And uh, I got involved with the union. Um, and, and I don't really want to, I don't want to go too deep into that rabbit hole. Because, sure. But the, some the, the point that you got from that, that yes. you can transition to this business. Well, and the thing is, is that like, I'm not a, like, I would never want a union inside of my organization uh, because I don't think that it's necessary. I think that unions are necessary when you get so big that management looks at the, the labor as a number. Okay, well, then it makes sense that they're able to speak as one voice. But mine was always a, yes, if you have a vision, but you can't execute that vision without the people that are on the front lines producing it. So you can't, you can't leave them out of the overall picture and in general uh they're the ones that know like they they're the ones that are executing and operating on a daily basis so you shouldn't necessarily set up in an office and make decisions you should go out to the floor and actually find out what is happening on the floor and and include them as much in the decision making process because i saw at chrysler engineers would design cars and design motors but they design them to be put together not to inevitably be worked on them um right. and it's always a nightmare to try and work on them because the engineer never took into account sooner or later it has to be taken apart and put back together i know sometimes you know i get in a car and my first thought when i get in a car is, is it made for a woman and i know that <laughs> you know you don't necessarily make cars specifically, but I do think there are some cars that are friendlier to women, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have a Honda CRV, and the first I'm very concerned about it not breaking down when I'm out at night. I'm you know out at night all the time, and then it's, this is a very uh, small but big thing for me. Is I'm only five feet. And when I need to reach over to the door, like to open it or this door, I don't have to climb across the seat Understood. To, go, to go open the door, right? So it's, the size is just right for me. And mm -hmm. everything is geared that I can flip down the mirror and it's right there for me. And so I, I think this is my third under CRV because now I don't want to give up this car. So I totally understand, you know, utilizing those things that you learn on, on whether it's an assembly line or just with engineering and putting that into your, your business. Because no, and it, and it, you don't it, it really, yeah. no. And I mean, I will, the, the, the time at Chrysler has served me well because it taught me mass manufacturing. It taught me workflow and man assignments. It taught me ergonomics. And, and both of my operations are bank conversions. Uh, so to be able to go in there and turn the teller area into the barista and the coffee area, turn the offices into an actual kitchen and work out the actual workflow and the heights to make sure that, uh, that it's set up for the average 
uh, not too tall, not too short, and, and finding that cool medium, I've been able to employ a lot of what I learned in that plant. Um, but as I told somebody else here recently, the two biggest things that I took out of that plant uh, were that quality is long-term viability and waste kills all. Like yes. what, wait, wasted steps, wasted thoughts, wasted movements, wait, wasted words, wasted actions, waste kills all. That is so true. Until you said it, maybe I'm, I'll have to put you in one of my quotes of the week of waste kills all. That, that is so true. Not only waste, but you, the quality assurance and the quality management that goes into food service can flow throughout all of your business. Mm -hmm. and, and Absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. So now that you've acquired all the skill, how are you giving back or, you know, helping others to become the first in their areas or to do what you do? Um, okay, so I mean, honestly, to, to unpack that, because asking that question, I, it's like, there are three different veins that I've tried to go with in that side of it. Um, one is my intermediate team, the people that are closest to me. Uh, I am a consummate learner. I read two to four books a week. And generally, if I read 10 books, really? yes, four I'm a, a yeah, and I mean, a, a pro tip, because I, I picked this up a, a while ago. Um, if you listen to the audiobook while you are reading the book, your comprehension doubles, your focus doubles, and your speed moving through the book doubles. Wow. Um, so I, it has become mandatory that if my, my team themselves, uh, that they must read. I don't expect them to read on that level, but they must read to always be learning and growing to bring more to the table. Um, but on a different level, I've always felt like anybody that gives of themselves or gives a piece of themselves to my business, that they should get something in return. And a lot of them are the younger generation. Uh, and when I had an employee come back to me and thank me because she told me that I had taught her how to be a good employee, um, that wasn't lost on me that I did that naturally with her because she was really a pleasure to be around. Um, but I've taken that more seriously where um, that coaching and that mentorship to the young people that come into my business, because I want, uh, I want to have an impact on their life in a positive way so that they become a good contributing member of society. And, and part of that is uh, working for people and working inside of organizations and, and having uh, respect and building up a reputation for being a good, hard, dependable, contributing individual to uh, to whatever group you put yourself into. Um, yes. But the third side of it is that I have a deep love and, and admiration for small business. Uh, I have started my own podcast with the intent of trying to champion small business and put the real story and the real struggles of small business out there. Uh, one because I want to see the information out there that I wish had been out there when I started my business in 2005. Uh, but two, because so many people look at small business and they're like, well, you're in business, you're a millionaire. And I'm like, that's, that's not true. That's that, that, that couldn't be the, uh, the furthest from reality. And the only way that you really are able to find that out is to bring small business entrepreneurs to the table and let them tell their story. Yes. And to tell the true story. Because I know Absolutely. some small businesses, you know, they want to look bigger than they are so that they could attract more. And in the meantime, if you look at the statistics uh, of the revenues for small businesses, it's like $50,000 a year. And for black businesses, particularly black women business, like $24 a year, 24000 24000 wow. a year, right? And that is not, I live in New York City. Maybe that is, can sustain you in a Midwestern, small Midwestern town, but $24,000 a year in New York City, you, you will need two or three more jobs minimum just to pay your rent. 
Absolutely. And, and I'll be honest with most people. And, and I mean, I try and teach the younger ones that too. They think that you get a dollar in the cash register and they think that that's a dollar that you keep. Yeah. And I'm laughing going, I, I'm just trying to keep pennies. Uh, so even, even in the Midwest, I mean, like nobody is going to survive on $24,000 because you have your cost of sale that has to come out of that. Uh, and as soon as you subtract that, you're automatically back in a, you cannot survive, uh, on that scale anywhere in America that just doesn't, uh, it does not, nothing adds what. And I tell that to the, the businesses that I coach. And if you're a product business where you have to actually buy merchandise or build something, that's even worse than a service business, right? Because a service business is mostly yourself and some people, you know, delivering a service for you. And that's a business I had before. But a product business, you have all the warehousing and you know all that stuff that people don't think about when they're starting you might start in your home or uh, you warehouse in your garage right <laughs> or your basement if you have one and you you don't think long term going this is not sustainable to do this if i go online and i start selling a couple of million dollars worth of goods my basement can't hold that or you know do you drop shit like what do you do and most business owners are just doing the thing that they know how to do when they get started and business is an art and a science and you have to know the nitty gritties someone said to me the other day i don't like numbers and i'm like well money kind of come in numbers <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> if you don't like numbers, you're telling me you don't like to make money or you don't want to make money because you've got to learn how to count if you really want to have a business. And even having like a CFO or a bookkeeper, it doesn't help because they could be robbing you blind and you have no clue if you don't understand that. So I I really I understand what you want to do with business owners and I support that because that's one of my goals as well is to really help business owners. Well, and I mean, I want to be, because I, I don't know, I'm the honesty, brutal, if necessary, um, yeah. entrepreneur, I, because I would never take away or, or want to uh, deny somebody their dream or their right to pursue their passion. But entrepreneurship is not right for everybody. Uh, nine out of 10 fail in the first year. And of the one that makes it, nine out of 10 fail in the first 10 years. And that carnage is real. And it affects a lot of people. And my thing is introspection. Know yourself. Because if you can literally look in the mirror and say, I don't like numbers. I don't want to understand numbers. Then you should not go into entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurship in order to truly be successful is about systemizing and it is about knowing your numbers and about knowing your key metrics and like I'm not like I wasn't good in school but I was really good at math for whatever reason I just enjoyed math now I have accountants and I have CPAs because that is their passion I don't find passion in that. I find the passion in the creative and passion in serving people and the connectivity of working with people. But the numbers have got to be understood and followed every single day. And if you don't at least have a desire to understand them, well, then you're never going to understand what success or failure looks like inside of your business. And then I'm not mad at you about that. Then right. you should. You should be an employee for somebody where numbers is not something that you have to pay attention to. Yes. And, I, and I'm just trying to be honest because I've seen the pain that comes with the failure because people do it for the wrong reasons or they jump out and do it without being any semblance of aware of the responsibility that comes with it. Or of a plan. They don't have a plan. They just feel like I want to start this 
I know a lot of people started businesses during the pandemic because of necessity for one thing. You know, there's mass, massive layoffs that were happening. Uh, people were out of work. And so they started doing their own thing. Now, some of them today turned that into really a successful venture. Now I see them starting to put structure into place because it was just one off. Let me get this done. Let me make some money at this. And whether it's making face masks or, you know, my beautician started doing hair from home, right? She actually turned her basement into a beauty parlor, which is something that she always was afraid to do, to go out on her own. Well, now when you're forced into this, and you have no other action because remember beauty parlors were one of the first that they shut down, right? This mm -hmm. in-person contact. And so she set up her, her basement where she could take one person at a time, enough time to clean, to do everything. And today she's more successful than she was. And she has no overhead, that big overhead that she was paying mm -hmm. someone else, right? for a, a space. So some people have done really, really well as a business owner and as a new business, but I've seen just as many fail mm -hmm. because during the pandemic, they did not have a plan of, as to what's next. Okay, so I started this, so what's next? And they don't have the money to pay for a coach and they don't have the money to do the marketing because they're all struggling. And so, you know, what would you say to those business owners if, if they have a chance? What, what would you be able to tell them how to keep the faith and, and move forward? Uh, and I mean, the thing is, is that innovation is, is this country. I mean, that's and again, because by and large, there's not a whole lot of originality, um, but it comes down to having that mental fortitude to always be looking uh, to solve problems and, and honestly looking for the next problem that is coming around the corner. Like I don't, I don't really subscribe to paranoia, uh, but I think that having a healthy paranoia uh, is not a bad thing because again, I mean, being in business is a lot about solving problems and putting out fires. And I mean, for many years, I woke up going, what fire am I going to have to put out today? What problem am I going to have to put out today? I didn't know what it was, but I knew when my feet hit the floor, it was going to be something. Um, I said for a long time that, uh, that the economy was going so good that sooner or later, the tide was going to go out and we were going to find out who was wearing clothes. Uh, now, I did not expect it to be a pandemic that was literally going to rush the tide out in the matter of weeks. Tsunami. Yes, but I did know that we had had it good for so long that there were people that were taking unnecessary risks because they thought the party was going to go on forever. And that is part of successful entrepreneurship is making it through economic cycles so that yes. you have a, a healthy amount of don't get over your skis because that the party can stop at, at any time and you might very well have to change gears and get very innovative just to in order to survive and keep your doors open and and is appreciate when it's good but always be preparing for when it's bad because if you look over our history and history repeats itself it's never good forever all good things come to an end and that's part of the planning Yes, I, I agree with that. And I know people, I, I really don't think a business has met all its challenges until it's been through a financial crisis. Absolutely. Whether it's induced by the economy or whether it's, you know, induced by some mistake of your fault. But when you're stretched for money and you're, you need to do things, and when you come through that, you have learned so much more. I mean, it's really true. The bad times teach you more than the good times, right? And 
I always ask that of business owners, like, have you been through, give name one crisis you've been through in your business. And I can hear, well, I haven't really been through a crisis. I'm like, oh my God, they're in trouble already. <laughs> and that right there, because it does. The, I mean, the pain uh, and the losses, if you have the right mindset, teach you far more than the gains and the wins. Yes. Um, because, and because that's the other side of it is that people hear about the sacrifice of business. Um, but it's not like if you go into business preparing, going, okay, I'm being told I'm going to have this major sacrifice that I'm going to have to make, but you, it's never going to come. But you're going to make all of these little small sacrifices. And when you look back over a decade, you're going to find out what we were talking about when we're talking about this big sacrifice, yes. because it comes in stacking of all of those small sacrifices. And it is going through that cycle where, I mean, I can remember times of having to choose, do, uh, do I put food on my own table uh, or do I pay the bill to make sure that the doors open tomorrow? And, and that is part of, uh, I guess earning your stripes is that you've got to go through those challenging times where your back is against the wall and you're going to have to make some tough decisions. Mine is just personal accountability that no matter what the decision is, I own it. No matter what the outcome is that I'm holding myself responsible for the decision uh, because it makes it a lot easier to keep going knowing I made my own bed. I'm not going to blame anybody else. Uh, I'm taking it as it comes. I decided I was going to be an entrepreneur and throw my hat in the ring. And and the world is not fair. Uh, and you still got to get up every day and navigate through it. How did your family take that when you said, I'm going to leave, you know, my J-O-B and I'm going to start my own business because the story is not always good where you have a supporting spouse or, you know, that you have people around you who are going, oh, great, go do that crazy thing, uh, Jason. You know, what What did your family think about that? No, it's uh, no support, no support. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, I'm laughing about it now. It was, uh, I mean, Honestly, it didn't feel good, but I can look back now and, and flat tell every entrepreneur, don't, don't expect people to support you. Um, uh, my personal thing was that you need fuel in the tank. For a lot of years, my, the fuel in my tank was telling people or p people telling me that I couldn't do something. Uh, it was, it was proving people wrong. And then I found something more positive. To where the fuel in my tank is just proving myself right but just because you have a grand idea that you believe in doesn't mean people uh, are going to jump on and be overly supportive of it it's your dream it's your vision get out there and chase it but don't expect other people to be right there to support you i mean that's no different than sports when people jumping on the bandwagon when you're yeah. successful they'll come and they'll start yeah. supporting you Yes. Um, but don't expect it the first day that you open up your doors. It just that's just not human nature. You know how I see that when you're an athlete, there's a lot of upfront work that people don't see. I mean, the day you catch that big touchdown and everybody's like, Jason, 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 they don't see all the number of years, maybe from your kid right that you've been putting in day after day team after team little league after little league or whatever you know thing you're doing they don't see that and and all of a sudden they think you just matured into you were always this magnificent person who can hit a ball or catch a touchdown or whatever and it's the same way in business when you see a lot of these successful business owners you're like, wow, they made $20 million or they made $10 million a year. And well, what about all the times that this person was in business for 20 years and not being able to pay the bill or not no. doing the things with family or with friends, you know, to support that until they got the right formula? Right. 
and or found the right product or maybe this the product they're selling now is not what they started out with and they had to morph into you know different iterations to get their product set right or their service and no one sees that it's just oh look at jason he's a you know billionaire or whatever but there's usually a, a big story behind that that I don't know if they really want to see that or they want the glamour of you, you know, just being an entrepreneur. I never know what what they want. Well, I mean, and don't get me wrong, because I'm not going to deny that, that I told myself I'm willing to sacrifice today what most people are not so that I can live tomorrow the way most people are not capable of. Um, but even today, I mean, I'm, I'm 47 right now. And as I as I think that my, as my path goes, I will be well into my fifties before I start actually truly achieving, uh, the, the things that I put in front of myself, the targets that I'm looking to hit. But I can say today, I sacrificed all of my thirties to be where I am. And I don't overly feel like I have overly accomplished anything. I still have so much more, uh, oh. to accomplish. Um, so the reality is I have sacrificed my thirties and my forties to be able to put myself in a place to truly bring that, that dream to fruition. And that is that overnight success rule that it's like they glamorize you when you hit the overnight success. They don't talk about the 10, 15, 20 years or the foundational pain and sacrifice that was done with virtually no notoriety before you just became an overnight success. And that's the whole point of you can look back and I can say I sacrificed a decade, two decades, because the sacrifice was while everybody was out partying, I was working. While everybody was at family gatherings, yes. I was working. Uh, and, and those are the, those, that's the real story of any business. Because all business starts as small business. They do. They do. And I totally understand that, that family mindset. Even though I didn't have an, you know, a, a standing building, I worked around the clock because I was delivering. I had a company that created marketing and analytics for Fortune 500 companies. And they are constant. They are a 24-hour shop, right, churning stuff out. And so when you have that kind of business, you are going to be sitting at Thanksgiving with your computer on your, your lap. You are going to, do, you know, be on vacation and not fully on vacation, right? Because you have to take that conference call or you have to get that product launched. And so you're never, never fully there. but the time that you are, you try to make the best of it, right? And so that's a way of sustaining your business, keeping your business going while appeasing your family and enjoying some family time. Do you have those kind of of uh, trade-offs in your life? I, I mean, and the thing is, is I'm going to be honest on that end of it. It's like as a man, I, I was raised in that traditional sense of the man went out and was the breadwinner and he worked and the mom did more to invest the time in raising the children. Uh, and, and I mean, and my mother was on the forefront of the women's live movement. So I have so much respect for women that are juggling, trying to pursue your ambition while also investing time in the children. Uh, but mine from a guy structure, I mean, it was a, no, there were, my kids would want my presence. And then when I would sit there and realize they just wanted to know I was within eye shot. Well, then that gave me anxiety. And I'm like, I can't do this. I'm going to go work. And if you need me, all you have to do is call and I'll come running. But I can't just sit here just so that you can have the comfort of knowing that I'm in the room or I'm in the house because work that, that is the, the backbone of who I am is based in the work. Uh, I don't overly subscribe to work-life balance uh, because I work seven days a week and it's part of what makes me feel normal. 
Um, but that's why I said entrepreneurship is really good for me because there's always something to work on. But that's what it comes down to uh, your personal priorities. Some people live to work. Some people work to live. Uh, and, and I need that work in my life to feel my semblance of normal. Interesting. You touched on something briefly that I was having a discussion with someone about. Uh, what do you feel about having your kids working in your business? Uh, well, I will say that, uh, that, that I attempted it uh, as, when they were kids. Uh, I, I joked about firing my daughter five times. Um, as adults, I told them I will open the door for you, uh, but you have to earn it, not as the boss's son or daughter, uh, as your own name. Uh, and I will say that both of them worked for me for multiple years in their 20s, and they both exited and went on uh, to pursue their own thing. And I told them both, this is my dream. This is my vision. This was how I was going to provide for myself. I'm not expecting you to embrace it. If you want to be involved in it and you're willing to earn it, then I'm happy to have you involved. But I don't buy into nepotism. Uh, and I'm not going to lose respect of my, uh, uh, of my team uh, over favoritism. So you're either going to come in here and you're going to earn it just like everybody else uh, or go work somewhere else because I'm not going to lose the respect of the people that are, that are here helping me build out my vision. So what's your exit strategy, Jason? I don't have one. And when I say I don't have one, so... I mean, don't get me wrong. I have fully looked at and I have thought about the exit strategy itself. My reality is that I could easily open a thousand, two thousand, three thousand stores. So the growth potential for everything that I have built is in my age or my life cycle of living, uh, is unlimited. And when I look at business in general, when you hear people talking about making changes or corporate structures for tax advantages, the exit is always where the tax man catches up with you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying that I will never exit because, I mean, there's a price for everything. And if somebody really came on and they were willing to pay me real value plus some potential value, uh, that I wouldn't potentially look at an exit because in business, everything's for sale. But in my head, I don't have any intentions of exiting. I have intentions of building a great team around me that allows me the freedom to participate in the pieces that I want to participate in and continuing to grow the business by growing the team and not being concerned of the exit itself, just being concerned with me having the freedom to participate where I want to participate and employ other people to manage the pieces that I don't want to be involved in. Excellent answer. I'm, I'm doing a, a presentation in Montreal next month around exit strategies. And I, I sold my business, but my business partner and I built the business to sell. Like from, from day one, we incorporated that into our operating agreement that we're going to build this to a certain threshold and this business should really kind of be our pension plan, I guess, for lack of a better description, right? We weren't corporate. We had fancy 401ks. We had all this stuff. And then voila, you're in small business and those things become a luxury sometimes, you know, you have to do everything first before you can start putting those kind of plans and savings in a place. And we said, this is how we are going to exit is by selling this business. And that way we could recoup some of what we lost in the 401ks and assets because we don't have anything to put in. We didn't have that compounding, you know, of interest. So you just got to take your lump sum and do something with that. So we built it to sell while there were some people who wanted legacy businesses, stuff to hand down. And then there were others like, I'll just run it till it ends itself, you know, kind of like you. I'll just get people to take it over and do what we do. 
But if you're no longer around to do it, like what is your plan on that? Um, well, I mean, I don't. Go ahead. Let's say you get sick tomorrow, God forbid, and you your you can't run it. Do you have designated people who will be running this business for you? Yes, absolutely. Now the thing is, is the same way that I started it from day one, uh, looking at a, a national brand. I am truly building a corporate structure, uh, so I have I am surrounding myself with a team. And we have been putting in those contingency plans that if anything should ever happen to any one of us, uh, what is the contingency to make sure that the business continues to move forward? Because I'm sitting there knowing that at some point I'm going to want to enjoy some of the fruits yes. of the labor. It'll just be in what capacity, but I have people underneath me that I'm exposing them to pieces that aren't necessarily in their wheelhouse or part of their main job description because I'm priming for the future knowing that whether I sell it or not, that I'm not going to want to continue operating it in the current form uh, right. and I will need other people that can do that. And part of that is that I feel so deeply about the culture that I'm trying to make sure that in my absence, the culture stays. Uh, so everything that I am doing is a, I'm thinking about replacing myself in the day to day, uh, whether, because I mean, there's Subway is a perfect example. I don't, he didn't build the business to sell or they didn't build the business to sell. But when a major investment firm comes in and offers you multi, multi hundreds of millions of dollars, okay, well, you found your exit. But had that offer not come through, Subway was still built as a great model and still ran by a corporate team. Uh, and, and they were very well off whether they actually had that major exit point that the government got half of or not. And, you know, that's funny because even though we built our business to sell it, we wanted a particular sale. We wanted someone who could take the business to the next level or 10 levels, you know, 10x this business. And so that's what we looked at because both, you know, Peggy and I saw that we could take this business just so far. And even from a financial sense, we might need more cash infused to take it here. And we wouldn't necessarily have that cash or be able to get funding for this kind of service business. So we looked at that and that's exactly what we did. Companies still running uh, probably 10 times more in revenue than we had, which is a joy to me because that's exactly what we wanted. Our strategic plan was for growth and growth in particular industries and they're executing like crazy on that plan. So. Every time I see it, I smile. I'm like, okay, we were right on target with that. Well, and that right there, that's why I said everything is for sale. The I, I am a constant learner because I don't want to feel like the growth of my business is hampered by my own ability. But I would also never want to get to a place to find out that I, I don't have the economic scale to make it reach a level and I have somebody else sitting there capable of doing that. Uh, while I'm not really big about thinking about the, the quote unquote legacy, I did build something uh, that was meant to outlive me. And it just comes down to the, the right opportunities and, and pursuing the right direction. Doing at this point, it is very much doing what is best for the business, the brands and the people that are actually operating it. Uh, because for a long time, I mean, my wife and children had to be or had to hear, we have to take care of these people because if we don't, the business will never take care right. of us. Right. And now that I've gotten to a point where the business is able to take care of us, it's a, okay, now we have to make decisions to protect that and what is in their best interest. Well, my last question, since I know you have a 2 o'clock, is 
do you feel bolder and more courageous when you have to try new things now? Now that you've gone through all this stuff that you haven't done, you've put stuff in place that you didn't have, you're in a brand new, you know, type of uh, dual business. When something new comes to you, do you hesitate or do you feel, hey, I can do this. I just have to apply the same principles. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of both because you use that bolder and courageous. Um, I, th th there's a part of me that I don't process risk the way the normal person does. A lot of people, the, the thought of risk gives them anxiety. Uh, so I don't process risk that way. But the other side of it is I also am a pretty humble individual and I keep my ego in check. So with me, I know that entrepreneurs get sidetracked because they're chasing shiny things. So anytime that I'm looking at a new opportunity, I'm questioning, does this fit in my ecosystem? Does this fit in the vision that I've drawn out? Or am I being distracted by a shiny thing? Uh, I'm always trying to keep myself in check because I'm not going to deny that through experience, um, my level of confidence about what I'm able to achieve has grown exponentially because I survived all of those painful moments and I came out the other end stronger. Um, but I also, like I said, the, the, to be bold, it, it, I first question, is my ego getting in the way? Because if you're making decisions based on ego, most of the time it's not a right decision. Sure. Uh, and am I chasing a shiny thing? Uh, and as long as it's not ego driven and I'm not chasing a shiny thing, then yes, ultimately, I am coming to the table with a lot more confidence to execute today th than I was in the past. And that's because of the pains that I've survived. You know, I, I find uh, I don't consider things as so much risks anymore. And I'm willing to try, but I always have a cutoff point. Okay, I will try it here. And if it doesn't work in the next six months, a year, and it's not going, then I'm not averse to saying, let's stop this. This isn't working. Let's try something else. But I find I'm, I do have the courage to try a lot of new things. And I've always been like that. Even when I was corporate, I was more suited to the new shiny object. Uh, let's try, you know, let's try that and see what it comes up with. So I was always, new was always in my resume, new products, new business, new, you know, so that's the kind of person I am in terms of, of risk taking. I'm not a risk taker in certain parts of my life, but in business, I'm, I'm not a bad risk taker at all. So thank you, Jason. Thank you for being uh, on the first with Dr. Sandy. And I hope I can return the favor. If you have a podcast, I'll be more than happy to return the favor to you as well to participate. Just send me some info and let me know when and, you know, if that's in the works already. I'm not, I don't even remember. But thank you. This was very interesting to have you on. Thank you very much. And I and thank you for bringing me on. I appreciate it very much. Anytime. This is Dr. Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing your journey on the first, where no two stories are alike, even if the circumstances are similar. Let this discussion serve as inspiration for others to show what's possible, and more importantly, to produce seconds and thirds.